Her name is all too familiar. Katrina, the storm that ravaged New Orleans. You always hear about the doomsday storm. Well, this was it. She left in her wake around 1,300 dead, hundreds of thousands homeless, and one of the most vibrant cities in America, drowning and nearly destroyed. Wherever she went, she was going to have an impact. This was a large, powerful hurricane. In Katrina's wake, there are also questions. With improved hurricane forecasts, was the storm a predictable disaster? Who knew? We were pretty convinced that it was just a matter of time. I knew I was right. I knew that it could happen. And who refused to listen? We had a number of officials who basically scoffed at us. Almost surrounded by water, the city is protected by levees and walls. Were these overwhelmed by an unprecedented storm or simply not up to the job? The concrete structure would just push laterally like the blade of a bulldozer. Who would ever think the levees would fail? It's just something I never in my wildest dreams thought I would ever see or could ever happen. With more violent hurricanes predicted, is Katrina a taste of what's in store for the future? This season has taught us that we had better be ready for intense storms. We can protect ourselves, but only if we understand the storm that drowned the city. Up next on Nova. Corporate funding for NOVA is provided by Google. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, serving society through biomedical research and science education, HHMI, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by PBS viewers like you. Thank you. It looks like an ordinary day in New Orleans. The city is just awakening, and it's business as usual. Africa Brumfield, a resident of the 6th Ward, is up for an early morning walk. Walter Maestri, an emergency manager, is on his way to his office at Jefferson Parish. On the Gulf Coast, northeast of the city, Lisa Monte has dropped in at her neighbor's. Things seem calm, but there's trouble looming. At the National Hurricane Center in Florida, the meteorologists are busy. It's hurricane season, and there's a storm called Katrina approaching, with New Orleans in her sights. Max Mayfield heads the hurricane watch team. Katrina formed from a tropical wave that uh, had moved off the coast of Africa, and then it developed into a tropical depression. I believe that Katrina has all the makings of a killer storm. Alert for threats to his parish, Walter Maestri called it right. Six days later, the killer storm arrived. The wind started shaking the facility pretty good at that point. There was water, and it never stopped coming in. There was water from here all the way that way to the Superdome, and then all the way to the Industrial Canal. You're sitting there, and you're wondering, how are you going to stay sane? And then the lights go out. I have nothing, nothing. Yeah, very, very hungry. We haven't eaten in three days. Would you please, please help us? We want her back. We want her back. <laughs> It 
It's a year before Katrina hits, and Hurricane Pam is striking New Orleans with 120 mile per hour winds. Floodwaters are surging into the city. But fortunately, this hurricane is not real. The fictional Hurricane Pam was created by Ivor van Heerden in his supercomputer, using data from past storms, wind, rain, and storm surge. What became very clear to us was that even a slow-moving Category 3 storm would totally flood New Orleans. This computer simulation was the focus of a 2004 disaster exercise held in Louisiana's capital, Baton Rouge. This was attended by about 300 people from the federal level, from the state level, and they sat together for about eight days and discussed some of the major issues that they would face if there was a catastrophic hurricane that struck New Orleans. The simulation showed New Orleans would be devastated. 61,000 people dead, over 175,000 injured, and half a million homeless. On the surface, participants seem to take the exercise seriously. I think everyone involved, particularly on the local level, understood what we were dealing with, understood what the various roles were, who was going to do what, where, when, and how. But underneath, there was skepticism. At the Hurricane Pam exercise, we had a number of officials who basically scoffed at us. Would the lessons from the Pam simulation be heeded when the real threat came along? It's over a year after the Hurricane Pam exercise, and the 2005 hurricane season has begun. Thunderstorms are brewing off the west coast of Africa. One of these will give birth to Katrina. What the thunderstorms do is they draw heat from the ocean surface. That's the driving mechanism that produces hurricanes. Katrina begins as a small storm called a tropical depression, a center of low atmospheric pressure. In the warm waters of the eastern Atlantic, water vapor rises from the ocean, then cools, forming clouds and releasing heat energy, which fuels the storm. This sucks in more warm air, generating strong winds which shoot upwards. When this rush of air hits the stratosphere, it flattens out. And influenced by the Earth's rotation, the storm starts turning counterclockwise. As soon as the winds reach 39 miles per hour, the depression is considered a tropical storm. This is Katrina, minus six days. Large, but still only a tropical depression. A day later, there's bad news. The Hurricane Center has upgraded the depression to a tropical storm. Roughly half of all tropical storms become hurricanes, so the team generates computer models to forecast where Katrina might strike. In 2004, more than a third of the population of New Orleans evacuated for Hurricane Ivan unnecessarily, as it turned out. But no warning at all can cost lives. Hurricane forecasts are improving due to a greater understanding of atmospheric dynamics and more extensive satellite coverage. We rely very heavily on remote sensing via satellites, and we have various satellites in which we do that. But the team needs more data than even satellites can provide. So as soon as Tropical Storm Katrina is within range, they send out the Air Force Hurricane Hunters. Their mission? To fly right into the approaching storm. As the pilot battles extreme turbulence, external sensors record wind speed, pressure, and temperature to build up a more detailed picture of Katrina. And a new piece of technology has been added to the Hurricane Hunters' arsenal. 
This is the drop sonde. It acts much like a weather balloon, collecting temperature, relative humidity, and also pressure. There's also a GPS module that will be affected as it shifts from one point to the next. That'll give us our wind direction and wind speed. The sonde is released through a chute in the floor. And then as it floats down to the surface, it's radioing back all that data. As the sonde is tossed about, its GPS unit feeds back its position, relaying wind speeds at many different points in the storm. Clearly, Katrina is building. During this one flight, wind speeds have increased to 59 miles per hour, approaching hurricane force. This data is fed to the Hurricane Center's supercomputers, which generate a prediction cone, where a black line shows the five-day forecast of the hurricane's likely track. The hurricane is steered by zones of high and low atmospheric pressure surrounding it. These constantly shifting weather systems make track forecasting incredibly complex. But in recent years, the team has made huge advances. We've got a real success story here. The observations are indeed better, the computers are faster, and, and the computer modeling is much improved. So now our five-day forecasts are exactly what our three-day forecasts were just 15 years ago. But intensity is much harder to predict than track because the inner storm can change minute by minute. Katrina is still only a tropical storm. The key question is, will she become a hurricane? Well, here in the United States, uh, we categorize hurricanes as category one through five, with five being the worst. At the bottom of the scale is a category one, with wind speeds of up to 95 miles per hour, causing damage to trees and branches. Category two, the hurricane has winds of up to 110 miles per hour, enough to punch the air out of your lungs. When the wind speeds hit 130 miles per hour, the hurricane becomes a category three. At category four, roof tiles are peeled off and houses will sustain structural damage. Category five is the most feared. With winds of more than 155 miles per hour, Whole roofs are sheared off and houses destroyed. But hurricanes deliver a deadly double blow. Not just high winds, but a massive bulge of water called the storm surge. The high winds push down on the ocean surface, causing the water to rise like an unnaturally high tide. This wall of water is so dangerous that 90% of deaths in hurricanes come from drowning. On Thursday, the 25th of August, Katrina finally grows into a Category 1 hurricane. She has formed an eye and is heading straight for southern Florida. Less than two hours later, she hits land. With no warm water to fuel her fury, Katrina dies down. But there's more warm water ahead in the Gulf of Mexico. In New Orleans, Walter Maestri watches the storm track nervously. He knows from near misses like Hurricane Georges in 98 and Ivan last year how vulnerable the city is. New Orleans lies between two potential floodwaters, the Mississippi to the south and Lake Pontchartrain connected to the Gulf in the north. The metropolitan New Orleans area is a bowl. It looks like a gigantic soup bowl. We exist on average some seven to 10 feet below sea level. When the Mississippi flooded every year, it deposited silt to create vast, boggy marshlands. The city itself was built on the only natural high ground, which would become the French Quarter. Joe Suheda is a coastal engineer who studies the city's defenses. The city was established at around uh, the year 1700, and it was established on high ground that was adjacent to the Mississippi River. 
and uh, this high ground was not flooded annually. Surrounded by marshlands, New Orleans couldn't grow until an engineer named Baldwin Wood designed a complex system of pumps and drainage canals to dry the city. Much of the system is still working today. And with the flood-prone areas dry, New Orleans expanded outwards from the French Quarter, all over the drained wetlands. But this created a bigger problem. In order to settle the areas, they've got to drain the water out of them. Well, as those soils then become drained, the organic matter breaks down just like compost, and so you lose bulk and the soils then shrink. The shrinking soils caused the city to sink further. To protect the growing population, the state built earthen levees, sometimes with prison labor. But in 1927, the Mississippi burst her banks in a catastrophic flood that killed at least 500 people and swamped more than a million homes. Although the flood never reached New Orleans, the authorities dynamited a levee south of the city as a precaution. The resulting man-made flood drowned two of the poorest parishes and displaced some 10,000 of their inhabitants. And it was a turning point as the Army Corps of Engineers took control of the levees. From that point on, the Corps of Engineers and the federal government have had a large part to play in the levees, especially the Mississippi River levees in the city of New Orleans and, and southern Louisiana. Colonel Richard Wagonar is now in charge of a 1,200-strong team. It's their responsibility to build and repair the levees to protect against hurricanes like Katrina. New Orleans has two types of levee, the original earthen levees and more recently built concrete and steel flood walls. It was after Hurricane Betsy in 1965 that Congress set standards for the levees. Betsy was a Category 3 hurricane, causing extensive damage and flooding. Since then, Congress has provided the Army Corps of Engineers with funds to upgrade the levees to withstand a Category 3, and no more. A lot of the construction, uh, current day construction, was in the 60s. The flood walls were all finished early 90s. The system we were working on was a system to withstand a fast-moving Category 3. But with Katrina growing in the Gulf, would Category 3 levee protection be enough? On Friday, the 26th of August, Walter Maestri receives a worrying phone call. The week that Katrina made landfall, I got a phone call from Max Mayfield, the director of the National Hurricane Center. I called uh, Walter Maestri, who is the director of emergency management in Jefferson, Paris, Louisiana, and I told him, Walter, you better get ready. You've got to know Max Mayfield. He's an extremely low-key individual. Uh, not much upsets him. When you get that phone call from Max, it's serious. For Walter Maestri, it's the news he's been dreading. The National Hurricane Center shows the storm heading straight toward the Gulf Coast west of New Orleans, the very worst case scenario. Since a hurricane spins counterclockwise, it generates stronger winds and more pressure on its eastern flank. So the storm surge to the east is also more severe, directly threatening New Orleans. With so many of its neighborhoods below sea level, New Orleans is going to need its strongest defenses. Those defenses used to be provided by Louisiana's wetlands. Before its levees were built, the Mississippi River conveyed tons of silt and soil to the coast each year. Every spring when the river flooded, the wetlands were strengthened and replenished. These wetlands protected New Orleans against hurricane storm surges, soaking up the violent waters like a sponge, while stands of cypress trees acted as a windbreak. But when levees were built, they kept the river from flooding. The 
wetlands became starved of new soil and started disappearing at an alarming rate. Shea Penland is a coastal oceanographer who has witnessed this decline for over 30 years. It's creeping up on us, it's, it's occurring every day, the land's washing away every day, it's chronic. The depleted wetlands are more vulnerable to the encroachment of salt water from the Gulf, which kills most freshwater plants. Louisiana's wetlands are vanishing at the staggering rate of at least 20 square miles a year, nearly a football field every hour. And as wetlands disappear, storm surges rise, putting New Orleans at even greater risk. We dodged a bullet with Hurricane Andrew in 1992. We dodged a bullet with Hurricane George in 1998. And we dodged the atomic bomb with Ivan in 2004. But would New Orleans dodge the bullet this time? At Louisiana State University, Ivor Van Heerden and his team take what they know about Katrina and put it into the same computer model they developed for the disaster exercise called Hurricane Pam the year before. Hassan Mashriki is the man inputting the data. From the beginning, we saw that uh, Hurricane Katrina was a very, uh, very deadly storm. It would start to flood the lower parishes, and as it became stronger and stronger, it just started to indicate that it's going to flood the city. Van Heerden takes the news public, sending email after email to officials in charge. We knew on Saturday night that this was the big one, that it was going to sink New Orleans, and uh, so we try to get the word out as much as possible. CJ. Walter Maestri is desperately trying to get people to leave his parish. It was fairly obvious that um, this was going to be a storm that was going to land in our backyard. And uh, we need about uh, between 60 and 72 hours to get those who are willing to evacuate evacuated. And that, therefore, we were going to have to move. But surveys conducted earlier indicated that not everyone would be willing or able to evacuate. We understood that about 68.2% of the people would leave, which would have meant about 300,000 would have stayed. Many people have no transportation. But Lisa Monti, who does, decides to stay. She lives in Bay St. Louis on the Gulf Coast, 60 miles from New Orleans. She rode out one of the worst storms to hit the coastline, Hurricane Camille, in 1969. Camille didn't get us. We stayed here. Uh, it was a very long night. The wall shook, the floor shook. We, we had to scream. The wind was so loud. But the water from the beach didn't, didn't get near us in Camille. In her house set back from the beach, 20 feet above sea level, Lisa Monti assumes she is safe from Katrina. And in the heart of New Orleans, Africa Brumfield, with her house 12 feet below sea level, decides to remain as well. Some of our family members decided that they would leave, but my parents decided to stay, and I wasn't going to leave them and go to safety, so I decided to stay with them. But Max Mayfield and his Hurricane Watch team keep making frantic calls to warn of the impending danger. I wanted to be able to leave the National Hurricane Center that night knowing that I'd done everything that I could do. Jeff, we're going to start with you again. Of course, New Orleans under a hurricane warning, and now it has been bumped up to Category 5. The Army Corps of Engineers is evacuating most of its staff to be on standby, safe from the storm. We have a plan for a team to remain behind in New Orleans, uh, an eight or nine man team in a bunker that's certified for a Category 5 storm. Perry Lartigue is one of the men who stays to monitor the levees. And this is the bunker. This is the room that we manned the phones from the East OC office. There was eight of us with Colonel Wagner. 
Walter Maestri decides to evacuate most of his personnel. We get to a minimum staff very quickly, implement what we call our doomsday procedures, and, uh, and make sure that the fewest possible folks are at risk. The mayor issues the city's first ever mandatory evacuation. Every person is hereby ordered to immediately evacuate. But for Ivor Van Heerden, armed with his prophetic knowledge, desperation is setting in. I knew we were going to lose a lot of people. I knew there was going to be super devastation. I knew there would be thousands of families who would lose their livelihoods, lose their homes. I knew that we were going to see an awful amount of heartbreak. The city streets are all but deserted. Those who have remained are inside, preparing for the night ahead. The small contingent from the Army Corps makes hourly visits to check the height of the Mississippi. We're reading gauges, and from about 3 or 4 o'clock in the evening, Sunday evening until the last gauge I went out and read was at 10.30. Though the hurricane has not yet made landfall, the river has risen 11 feet. Around 10.30 or 11, the wind starts to get more and more rough. The Army team is forced to retreat to their steel-reinforced bunker and watch as Katrina wreaks her fury. We kept looking out the front door porthole watching the wind blow, but we, we felt safe. Outside, storm chasers are experiencing the storm's dramatic buildup firsthand. Around midnight, it got really bad. It was blowing to the point where the house would shake, not a lot, but it would move and you knew something was different about the way the wind was blowing. It was very cramped, and uh, of course, the adrenaline is very high. We've never been in the bunker for a hurricane. The wind wasn't rattling and just moving and shaking. It was banging like a bulldozer beating against the wall. It was just hitting, boom, boom. The house was shaking. It sounded like the walls were trying to just fall apart, and it was, it was a scary feeling, and I started to feel like I was in a coffin. At 6.10 a.m., Katrina strikes land. The National Hurricane Center has amazingly predicted her track to within about 20 miles. She has now veered to the east of the city, avoiding the worst-case scenario. But there is no escaping Katrina's devastating power. Watching events from Baton Rouge, Ivor Van Heerden and his team are especially concerned about the levees on the eastern side of the city. We felt the levees could be overtopped. During Hurricane Betsy, we had lost significant amounts of levees, especially on the Industrial Canal, and our fear was that the same thing was going to happen again. The eastern sections of New Orleans are bordered by the Industrial Canal and the Intercoastal Waterway, which connects to the Gulf. Katrina's storm surge would fire like a bullet up the intercoastal waterway toward the heart of the city. But if it happens, no officials will know. The Army Corps of Engineers has no external monitoring equipment. While the power lasts, the engineers rely on the media. Katrina has made landfall now. We had a lot of reports, people calling in or reporting things wrong with levees. Despite the confused nature of the calls, it is becoming clear that something has gone wrong with the levees. At about 7 a.m., a massive storm surge charges into eastern New Orleans. A 15-foot wave is funneled up the intercoastal waterway and smashes into the industrial canal like a runaway train. The earthen levees around the canal are first overtopped and then scoured away by the force of the water. Hit immediately are New Orleans East, the Lower Ninth Ward, and the Upper Ninth. Residents of these poor and working class areas had been warning for years about the threat of a storm surge. The water rushes into the Lower Ninth Ward and St. Bernard Parish at incredible speed. 77-year-old August Hubbard had taken shelter in a small hotel in the Lower Ninth. But a 10-foot surge of water floods the building within minutes. A Navy veteran of Korea and Vietnam, 
he finds himself swimming for his life. The water was up to my chest, but I took and stumbled and went down, and the water was up to my, up to my mouth almost. They might have snakes, they might have alligators, they might have anything in the water. And we could see like some of these gas pipes, and I could see like streams of bubbles coming up, and that was gas. As in the great flood of 1927, the poorest districts suffer most. People are left to fend for themselves as the water rises. And the storm is not over yet. At around 10 a.m., Katrina makes landfall again near Bay St. Louis and Gulfport, 35 miles northeast of New Orleans. Here on the dangerous eastern side of the eye, the storm surge is a phenomenal 28 feet. Recorded by storm chasers, houses and cars are swept away by the incoming water. In Bay St. Louis, Lisa Monty, supposedly safe on high ground, is stranded on her upstairs balcony. The water had raced down the street and was filled the yard and all the debris as it came in. The building shook and rocked so much that I didn't know how long it would stand. Let's go, let's go, come on, come on. All along the coast, entire communities are wiped out. Back in New Orleans, confusion reigns. Electricity is off. Landlines and cell phone networks are down. With communications decimated, city officials and emergency teams are unaware of the extent of the damage, especially the flooding in the Ninth Ward. By early afternoon, Katrina is moving inland, progressing north and gradually weakening. When the storm left and started to move to the north, we felt blessed because it appeared that Katrina had not been, uh, you know, as devastating as we thought. But they couldn't be more wrong. A second huge flood has already hit the city. Around 2 p.m., Colonel Wagonar and his engineers finally head downtown to check on vague reports of damage to the drainage canals at London Avenue and 17th Street. There was a civilian that had told us that there was an overtopping or something wrong with the wall. But over a mile from the 17th Street Canal, they are stopped in their tracks. We could not get any closer. We encountered significant amounts of water at what we call the I-10, 610 split on the interstate highway, uh, probably 10 to 15 feet of water. I knew at that point that that was much more water than it had come down from rainfall. The 17th Street and London Avenue canals burst in three major locations sometime around 10 a.m. Throughout the day, water from Lake Pontchartrain pours at high pressure into the heart of New Orleans. The city's huge pumps, only designed to deal with rainfall, are no match for the rising water. Nothing can be done to stop the water gushing in through the gaping breaches in the two canals. One of the problems is that the system is designed to keep the water out, but there was no provision really for managing the water once it got inside the city. There wasn't a specific plan uh, to fight the floods if a flood wall failed. We had a plan from the organizational perspective, but not specifically to fight if there was a failure of a flood wall. As the afternoon progresses, water continues to pour into the city. The New Orleans Bowl is filling up. Africa Brumfield's home is downtown, near the London Avenue Canal, right in the path of the second flood. I sat outside from about 3 when the water started to come in until maybe 7 o'clock that night watching the water rise from the ground and it continued to rise and it continued to rise. So we went into the house and we figured it'll stop. So I, I tried to lie down and go to sleep, but who can rest in situations like that? It was getting dark and that night we returned to the district um, and just hunkered down for the night. Uh, there was only still the nine of us. Um, and waited for the next morning to get back out there and do our assessments. By nightfall, 
the water is still rising. But with communications out, many in the sleeping city are unaware of the danger. We could have got uh, vehicles uh, driving on the interstates with bullhorns telling people. We even could have used helicopters with bullhorns. We could have warned the people, the big floods coming, take evasive action. We didn't. People went to bed on, on Monday evening, houses dry, and woke up in the middle of the night with water up to their waists. I got up around midnight and it was still rising in the house and my house sat up about four feet off of the ground. And I was thinking, if my house is four feet off the ground and the water is in my house, I'm only five feet one, and it's in my house about two feet, there's no way that I'm getting outside without going for a nice swim. As dawn breaks on Tuesday, the extent of the damage is becoming clear. There are multiple breaks in the levees. Two major ones on the industrial canal that flooded the 9th Ward to the east, and three on the 17th Street and London Avenue canals, which filled up the Central City Bowl. 75% of Greater New Orleans is now underwater. And it is still full of people. Rescue teams are massively overloaded. For more than half a century, no U.S. hurricane has affected so many. We worked from probably five o'clock all through the night without stopping into the next night. We grabbed air mattresses and pots because we needed something to paddle with. And we got in the water and we started to paddle on the air mattresses with the pots. People are screaming, help us. Can you please help us? I sent two of my really good friends back and they saved a lot of elderly people that really couldn't walk or move and a lot of little children. I was bringing out at least 50 people per run, and I made runs for a week solid. I was worn out. You always hear about the doomsday storm that they've been predicting for 100 years to hit the city. Well, this was it. When the water finally stops rising in the flooded city, work can resume on fixing the flood walls. With roads and canals blocked, the Army Corps of Engineers is initially restricted to helicopters. It's a Chinook helicopter, it's a medium lift helicopter, and there are three, should be three sandbags underneath that, and it is reinforcing one of the sites that was breached on the London Avenue Canal. So underneath all of this rock and gravel are sandbags, well you can see them right here, sandbags just like that. So they're flying over to that breach, uh, dropping the sandbags and building up the height of that wall that's stopping the water from moving from the canal uh, to the flooded areas. Eventually, the breaches are filled and the water begins to be pumped out. But it will take over a month before the city is dry. In the meantime, rescue efforts continue. Hundreds are pulled from their wrecked homes. 77-year-old August Hubbard from the Lower Ninth Ward spends a freezing night after swimming to an overpass until a helicopter finally picks him up. The helicopters kept passing and waving at us. They put me in the hospital. I stood in the hospital three and a half days because I had the diarrhea and they checking my heart and stuff like that. Well, they brought me to an airplane hangar and they had like about four or five thousand people in there and we were sleeping on mattresses. The chaotic official response means that there is still no food or water available to the crowds of people in the city. For many, there is no way out. Civilization is breaking down around them. We passed a lady in a hospital bed being pushed on the interstate. And all of a sudden, reality hits you of where you are and what's really happening to you. The rescued and displaced are told to head for shelter at the Superdome and the Convention Center. In a story that's all too familiar, many are forced to wait in squalid conditions for days. All around them, the city lies in ruins. 60,000 houses in New Orleans and other communities are eventually declared damaged beyond repair. 
In New Orleans alone, over a thousand people have lost their lives. It's just something I never in my wildest dreams thought what I would ever see or could ever happen. Who would have ever thought 100,000 people, you know, would stay for a Category 5 hurricane? I guess the reason they stayed is, who would ever think the levees would fail? So was the damage and loss of life avoidable? Why did the levees fail? In the wake of the storm, questions began to be asked, and they focused on the height of the storm surge. On the Gulf Coast, Bay St. Louis was on the dangerous eastern side of the eye when the surge hit. Lisa Monte's town experienced the maximum 28-foot height of the surge. You could see how massive the wall of water was that climbed up and did all of this destruction. As far as you can see on either side of the beach, there really, there is nothing. I've heard so many workers who are from out of town say, I can tell that this was a special place. New Orleans was on the less powerful western side of the hurricane. Still, a wave of 18 to 25 feet shot up the intercoastal waterway and along the industrial canal. It overtopped the Category 3 levee walls by more than five feet, scouring away their foundations and pushing them aside. It became clear that overtopping was the main reason the levees had failed around the lower Ninth Ward. But the breaches that flooded downtown New Orleans were more difficult to figure out. By the time the storm surge reached the 17th Street and London Avenue canals, its height was much lower. In theory, the flood walls along these two canals should not have failed like the overtopped levees of the industrial canal to the east. The water never got within two feet of the top. The London Avenue and 17th Street canals did not experience Category 3 conditions. They experienced conditions of a Category 1 or Category 2 storm, so the design criteria weren't exceeded. So if they weren't overtopped, why did they fail? That is the subject of a major engineering investigation. We're right now at the northern end of what is called the 17th Street Canal. Uh, right at the uh, lake shore. That's the breach. That's ground zero, as it was called. As with a boat, all you need is one hole and the whole boat can sink. This actually was the weak link in the chain. But the problem lies deeper than the concrete flood wall itself. Joe Suheda is looking for evidence to support his theory that the walls were not overtopped, but undermined. Now, was this dirt always here, this hill? Yeah, but it was not here, it was back. See, that's what we suspected. This area was, as we just suspected, about 30 feet closer to the water, and the movement of the earth, which went sideways, actually lifted the house up, that's you say. That's correct, it's yeah, up that's in the That's amazing. Air. The flood walls had undergone what engineers call a pressure burst. They were undermined by their own foundations, soft, peaty soil, no match for the force of the water. This is what we had suspected in terms of the mechanism of failure, was uh, that the flood wall failed at the base, the earth was too weak, and the, the sheet piling itself and the monolith, the concrete structure, were just pushed laterally like the blade of a bulldozer. Evidence suggests that the flood wall failures could have been prevented if the pilings had been driven more deeply into the ground. What is now very obvious is that these walls were under-designed, under-engineered. It was basically a catastrophic structural failure of those levee systems. The Army Corps of Engineers plans to repair the levees up to Category 3 by next hurricane season. But the flood wall failure has called into question the reliability of the entire levee system, just at a time when it may be needed more than ever. 2005 turned out to be the busiest hurricane season on record. Katrina was swiftly followed by Rita, causing more damage to the Gulf Coast. Stan, smashing into Central America. And Wilma, devastating Mexico and Florida, 
Meteorologists have now run out of letters in the Roman alphabet. Moving on to the Greek, the first ever hurricanes Alpha, Beta, and so on were recorded. For decades, scientists have understood that hurricanes come in cycles. We think here at the National Hurricane Center that uh, hurricane activity is cyclical and you'll have uh, some active periods followed by inactive periods followed by active uh, years again. And in fact, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s were very active in the Atlantic Basin. The 70s, 80s, and early 90s, very inactive. And then 1995, we really became active again. But some scientists believe that cycles alone do not explain the increase in powerful hurricanes. Studies of global hurricane activity over the last 30 years have shown that although hurricane frequency seems unchanged, the average intensity has increased. The number of category four or five storms has almost doubled. Peter Webster believes this is linked to rising ocean temperatures all over the world. The bottom line of, of our study is that we find a consistency between the increase of surface temperature in all of the oceans and uh, a change in intensity to more intense storms. Over the last 30 years, global sea surface temperatures have climbed about one degree Fahrenheit or over half a degree centigrade and this provides vast amounts of extra energy for hurricanes. One hurricane is equivalent of 100,000 atomic bombs. That's incredible power. In just one area, such as the Gulf of Mexico, that small half a degree increase in temperature of the sea surface is the equivalent energy of about a million atomic bombs. If you think of it in terms of the fact that there's enough energy in that half degree to generate an extra 10 strong hurricanes, then you start to see the size of the problem. Global warming, the heating of the atmosphere often associated with human activity, has been invoked to explain both the rise in ocean temperatures and more intense hurricanes. So one is left, in a sense, to the greenhouse gases increase as, a, as probably the reason that we're getting the sea surface temperature increase. Uh, I think that's been studied, and uh, I think that most reasonable scientists will make that association. But not everyone agrees. A lot of people ask about the relationship between hurricanes and global warming, and that's certainly a fair question. Uh, we think that hurricane activity can be explained uh, without invoking global warming. But scientists do agree that things are going to get worse before they get better. The bad news here is that the research meteorologists tell us that this active period that we're in uh, could very well last another 10 or 20 years. So uh, my message there is, uh, no matter what, uh, we're in this active period and we need to all be prepared. With its defenses found wanting, New Orleans will have to struggle to be ready for the next assault. All indications are that the levees and flood walls are not up to the job of protecting the city, even from a Category 3 hurricane. There is no money to upgrade them, even though more Category 4 and 5s are expected. Category 3 protection was not adequate. It's clear to me that if we're going to re uh, build a city, that it uh, has to be built upon a basis of Category 5 protection. It clearly would have made sense to protect and, and avoid the federal government spending the hundreds of billions of dollars by investing an additional, let's say, $2 billion in levy protection. But levees are not the only way to protect a sinking city. More radical options are now on the table. Much of the city is below sea level. I think uh, given the opportunity in situations like uh, it's over my shoulder here where the area will have to be completely demolished, that we rebuild those and basically invert the bowl, bring sediments in to raise the ground, perhaps up as high as we're standing right now. But preventing further destruction of the environment may be as effective as any ambitious rebuilding scheme. The ultimate key to uh, Louisiana's survival and reducing the impacts of surges is to restore our coastal wetlands. These wetlands uh, knock down the surge and they also reduce wind energy as, as the storms pass over them. After nearly a century of building levees to control the Mississippi, one idea is to let parts of the river run wild once more. 
This plan would create a new tributary that would be allowed to flood, deposit silt, and rebuild the wetlands. This would cost billions and take as long as 50 years. But just as difficult may be the task of rebuilding the confidence of the people of New Orleans. Both the disaster and the long, slow process of rebuilding have convinced many not to return. This was home. And I've been all over the world, thanks to the military. Nothing ever felt like New Orleans, ever. But I can't come back to live. Going through that again is too scary. For those who had long predicted this calamity, all the attention now being given to hurricane protection has brought no contentment. With around 1,300 dead and 800,000 homeless, the price has been far too high. It's hardy to say it, but I knew I was right. I knew that it could happen. Uh, it's horrible that it did. And what I see around me now on the faces of the individuals who have lost everything and don't know, you know what's going to happen to them, um, that's devastating. That's the devastating part. And for those scientists who'd seen their warnings ignored, it hits especially hard. You know, I'm really heart sore for those people. You walk past some of these homes, only half of them are standing because they've been destroyed by the floods. They've lost so much, so, so much. And I think that's the, the, the really hard part for me to take, is I knew it was coming. And to go and see it day after day is really distressful. NOVA is a production of WGBH Boston. Corporate funding for NOVA is provided by Google. Major funding for NOVA is provided by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, serving society through biomedical research and science education, HHMI, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by PBS viewers like you. Thank you. We are PBS.